Yes, Stan, please. Uh, my name is uh, my name is uh, Rob Lagerveld. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, good uh, explanation on the WTO. It's very uh, very good, I think. I have a question. Maybe you can explain something more about the regulation regulatory cooperation cooperation, which is part of the TTIP, which in, uh, according to me gives the uh, corporations the power to uh, to develop laws and also to uh, say to countries that certain laws and regulations that exist now are uh, not passing the necessity test and they should be abolished. Thank you. Actually, you, you know it better than I, Rob. So if you want, you, you say more because it's a very important point. Say more. Thanks, Rob. Go ahead, Rob. Okay. Well, I don't know to say much more about it. The thing is that um, uh, there's, there's a struggle going on between the governments of the EU and the US and the Canada, for example, when it goes about uh, CETA. That they say, no, there's nothing wrong. Uh, the, the, the governments, they can go on by uh, making laws, making regulations to protect, for example, the, the, the labor or to protect the environment, environment, etc. But in fact, uh, some of the uh, leaked documents from TTIP and from CETA, they state that there is an uh, part which is called regulatory cooperation and it gives the uh, corporations the uh, possibility to start uh, to be at the table with the politicians uh, just where the laws are being uh, developed so in fact it's the practice already because if you look at the European Commission they always go to the now when it's important law making being uh, considered they go to the big companies to say please write the, the new law for me and uh, within two weeks they present the law as if they they invented it so but now it will be uh, very much uh, laid down in documents and it will be signed so the companies <coughs> in fact will have a very important um, effect and also about existing laws they can uh, every year a government, uh, maybe the city government or the national government, they have to prove that every law, every regulation still uh, is, is okay in, uh, for the economy. And the governments, uh, the corporations can then say, okay, well, this particular law uh, protecting this uh, environment or the healthcare is in, uh, not in our interest. It should uh, go. It should be changed. So something like this. Thank you. I think it's very disturbing. Excellent. It is. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to uh, ask one thing is that there's also going to be uh, a committee formed which is going to monitor the implementation and make recommendations and that committee is going to comprise mostly people from business. I forget the name of the committee. I, I know it's, uh, I'm sorry, it, it is a committee and it's basically designed to follow up on all these uh, regulations. Regulatory and... Council. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Regulatory Council. Thanks. Yeah. I think we have the next question. You already have the mic. Please stand up. No. Go ahead. Hi. Hello. My name is Justin. I have two questions regarding the labor union. What What would you say was the will be the lab, um, the role of the labor union within the TTIP framework? And then, um, how do developed countries keep a balance of regu regulating the labor uh, law uh, between regulate, uh, regulating the labor market and being welcome, uh, or being beneficial for companies to build their factories, let's say in Europe or US, yeah. instead of deregulating countries that motivate. Uh, factory owners to move their factories in those countries. Thank you. Howard, can you please uh, repeat the questions in your answer? Do you want me to answer this one? So basically, it is uh, how the Europeans are going to deal with this labor regulatory environment in a way which doesn't deter foreign investors coming to Europe. I mean, if that's well, because, correct. Um, let's say in the US, they labor unions don't have that much of a power, yeah. to say. However, in Europe, it's a different story. Yeah. So I was wondering what is the position of the labor unions in general in the framework of the TTIP? 
I mean, the, the simple answer to that is that the aim is to weaken them. So, essentially, they will also be liable for prosecution if they uh, can be accused of losing companies' profits. Uh, and that is allowed in at least half of the states in the U.S. Okay, and so, that's one of the things that a lot of unions, so in 20 countries in Europe, the trade unions have mobilized against TTIP specifically on this issue because it's in a way condemning the unions to obscurity, you know, like in, in many states in the US. Thank you. We have a question in the back. Hello? I'm the, just curious what you think about Trump and he would bring to the global economy. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I think he would damage it, but <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what I have to say about Trump is that I think he's smarter than people give him credit for, in the sense that I think he understands what has been happening to the US economy as a result of globalization. I think he understands that. And he understands that many developing countries have found this path to achieving rapid growth at the expense of the advanced countries. I think he understands that. And I think one of the things that he wants is whether he can achieve it or not, I don't think it's, it's, he can achieve it, but he wants to try and block that. I mean, just a very simple thing. He said he's going to ask his economic advisors to calculate the extent to which the currencies of many East Asian countries are undervalued, meaning too cheap, so that their exports are too cheap into the US. And if he finds out that these countries are currencies are undervalued, he's going to put a tariff on the goods coming from those countries to the extent of the undervaluation. What he shows is that he knows it's an economic war. He knows it's a battle of exports. He understands that developing countries have gained a lot by actually fighting this economic war with lots of subsidies, with cheap labor, etc., etc., and he thinks he can stop that process. I mean, he said it most openly about Mexico, but I think that he still hasn't fully understood what is happening in the global economy. The time of the advanced countries is over, you know, and I don't think it's easy for them. I think, in a way, what he's doing is he's digging a bigger hole for the burial of the US economy, that's all. And I think the Europeans are sitting there, you know, very happy and smug, because now it's the US that's going to uh, get the brunt of it. And I think this is where uh, Europe is playing smarter and Trump is misunderstanding. He knows the problem, he knows the source of the problem, but the way he's dealing with it is, in my view, going to make it worse for the U.S. Can I ask for a small clarification? In what sense is Europe smarter than, than Trump in this one? Because I think what the Europeans are trying to do is to build as many bridges as they can with these developing countries and actually, in, in a sense, uh, ride on the coattails of many of these. So, you know, the Europeans are not making it a big secret that they want a bigger part of the Asian miracle, if you like. Okay, and they are now trying to cultivate all manner of countries. I'm just coming from Vietnam, where, you know, you see so much of a European presence now in Vietnam. You know, they want to do this, they want to do that. The European Union is giving lots of money for Vietnamese students to come and study in Holland and so on and so forth. They know that the future is here and rather than antagonize them, they want to see if they can participate in that process. And I think 
that's a smarter way to go. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, Howard. Uh, Can you stand up, please? Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the future of rational agreements in the context of this? The Russian? Uh, no, of rational. Rational. Oh, okay. I, uh, I mean, I don't really know about rational. <laughs> regional. 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 Oh, sorry. Regional. Sorry. Regional. Sorry. 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 regional agreements. Okay. I, I think they're important. I mean, I, I think they're really very important. I, I think the formation of blocks is a very important thing. Uh, and I think especially, especially from what I see, you see that block formation already taking place in East Asia. You know, it's not formally announced to anyone, but you see this incredible integration taking place where there are investment flows and trade flows increasing and alignment of currencies and so on. And I think for the rest of the world, something similar. So if you're from Latin America, I would advise the same thing to happen. Basically, it's the only way that Latin America can stand up to what Trump wants to do. I mean, he basically wants to take Latin America back into the US backyard. And to continue, I, I don't think this is a new policy. I think Obama actually deliberately undermined development in Latin America. I think the clearest example is what Obama and the Federal Reserve did to Brazil. You know, that's for me the clearest example. They're not going to tolerate Brazil industrializing and threatening the US in any way whatsoever. They will not allow Argentina to do that either. Because once these forces start building and you get a significant development, this is over for the United States. And I think they will do everything in their power. Now, from the Latin American point of view, I think unity will give some strength. You know, basically becoming more one block. How feasible that is, heaven knows. You know, I don't know the politics well enough. Thank you. Yes. Next question. Senna, yes. Yeah. Uh, in a way, you've answered my question partly, but I want to move. Can you speak in the microphone? Sorry. Thanks. In a way, you've answered my question partly, but I want a more clarification sort of, you know, how far the extent to which the developing countries or the other nations uh, who are reciprocating <coughs> this approach, like, you know, as you mentioned that Brazil, India, and Israel is sort of moving an agreement, do you know, to move from that, these issues like trade agreements, etc. But uh, a more sort of formal agreements are actually taking place, like, you know, GSP plus sort of things, which are moving, you know, providing sort of exemptions from this WTO rules. So how far that can be successful in a way if, you know, more developing economies or developing countries sort of move together by building such a block or whatsoever. Thank you. Just before you answer the question, it might be the case because I am not an ISS student that I do not understand every question perfectly well. So please clarify the question as well. Yeah. I'm not the expert who can do that. Thanks for your question. So basically he's asking the, the question about, so GSP, it means Generalized System of Preferences. Uh, and let's say it comes within uh, something called Special and Differential Treatment of Developing Countries. Uh, I have my reservations about this as a way of going forward because really special and differential treatment for many developing countries was a gimmick designed to keep them producing what they're producing. See, I give you differential treatment as long as you keep producing the primary commodities and the, the agricultural goods that I want you to produce. If you digress, so I might allow you to produce some leather products and shoes and you know, low value added manufacturers. But the day you cross that line and start producing what I am producing is the day I'm going to cut you off. So for me, developing countries that actually think they're going to develop by getting all these concessions are mistaken. 
You know, I think they have no other choice, really, in the final instance. It's something I keep repeating all the time, but industrialization. And industrialization not, I don't mean producing garments and textiles, you know, this is a bygone era. I mean producing the same goods that are produced in the advanced countries. And this is where the problem is. This is what Donald Trump is ex addressing very explicitly. He does not want those cheap goods that compete directly with American goods and take away American jobs, you see? So he definitely is not going to allow this type of concession. But uh, SDT and GSP, no problem for him. Thank you. We have a question in the back. <coughs> Hi, Herb. Um, I just I'm just curious if uh, after the EU signed out TTIP with the US, is there any relevant impact with the EU trade negotiation with ASEAN? Because um, yeah, as I know that it has been started since 2007, and I work for ASEAN, so I, I, I just want to I just want to see your comments. Sure, it's it's fundamental. It's fundamental. It, you know, Hillary Clinton called it the economic NATO. Have you, did you hear that? So basically, it's a blueprint for all other trade deals. And all other trade deals will now be looked at again in terms of what is agreed between Europe and US. So all the regulatory standards, all the labor, all the everything is going to be based on this TTIP. Uh, and I, I believe whatever Trump has said up to now, in the end, he will ratify a version of TTIP. It will just take a bit of time because he wants other elements put into these agreements. It's not that he's against those agreements, but I think then in all the discussions with ASEAN, so EU, uh, ASEAN, US ASEAN, I think all of them, what they want to do is to harmonize all these. After all of that is done, they will go back to the WTO and conclude Doha. Because now all the principles will be worked out, all the bases will be covered, and I think then Doha will be concluded. Because still, it has to be a global agreement to really work. Otherwise, you know, there are going to be all these conflicts. Well, you know, is this agreement between EU and ASEAN going to be contradicting this one between US and ASEAN, and so on and so forth? Okay, so it's only once they bring everyone together in Doha, then you will get the final agreement where you know, everyone has to sign up to that. So I think you should expect Doha will still come up and be on the table, uh, but your agreements will definitely go ahead, but after TTIP, and then they will be modified in view of what happens with TTIP. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned China as them, of course, a rising power and the next big player. So in essence, will we see that China joins the big uh, big boys club and, uh, and actually start to knock out these from the rest of the advancing countries? So they just uh, kind of turn the coat over and from the position where they were, they're just going to become a bully as well in themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I'm from Sri Lanka. And one thing that I always say in Sri Lanka is play off the big powers against each other. <coughs> But don't trust either one. And certainly don't trust China, because China also has its own interests there. And as soon as those interests are not served, they're not going to support you. I think this is something I also observed with the case of Brazil. You see, China seems to have promised Brazil a lot if Brazil provided it with the raw materials to keep its industrial machine going. But as soon as prices started to collapse, and Brazil started, its economy started to get into trouble, I didn't see China coming in and, and bolstering that economy. China will not do that. China is playing its own game. You know, not to say that they're worse than anyone else, it's just that's the game that the powerful countries play. Thank you. 
How Thank about you. like a sentiment of oh yeah about the sentiment of uh, what West has done to to China? Let's say, Can, is there some sentiment or business business doesn't seem sentiment or all okay. all, all feelings? Or Thanks, feelings. So comment on what the West did to China. <laughs> I I would not know. Uh, the one thing is I. I my observation, and it's just a very cursory one, is Chinese are pragmatic. You know, the past is the past. They are only looking at the future. And uh, the only thing I can think is a mistake that the West has made, and Europe in particular here, is pushing Russia towards China. I think the signing of this gas and oil deal between Russia and China is a big, big mistake for Europe. And I think there, Hillary Clinton pushed Europe into this over the Ukraine. And Europe got suckered. You know? And I think that was a real serious mistake. It's a serious economic mistake, because now the oil and gas that they were getting from Russia, they're going to get from the US and Canada. And it's not smart to put all your eggs in that one basket, you know, especially when Donald Trump is playing all these <laughs> strange games. Uh, I would have, you know, kept both things open and going. If maybe the Europeans are doing that, because Angela Merkel in particular is a very, very astute politician, and I would guess that, you know, she's not going to easily allow herself to be cornered like that. Thank you. But what I see is something else at the moment. Thank you. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, and traditionally with critical collective events, we call upon those who are critical about the views of the speaker to raise their voices in the end. So if you have a question uh, in which you have basically expressed your disagreement with Howard's presentation, uh, you are more than invited to, uh, to speak now. If it's, I thought, uh, yeah, if it's it one up. of my students, remember I'm marking your scripts. In this. <laughs> <laughs> I, you don't even need to say that. I thought I'd give it a try, but no, nothing. Uh, one question from my side, if I may. Um, having learned from reading uh, books about Western advisors in third world or so-called third world countries that produce raw materials, I always find out that Western advisors advise these countries to invest in infrastructure. Can you comment on why they do so? Well, it's, it's a very important point, Abu Hassan, because uh, recently a similar discussion arose with China and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. China gave a huge amount of aid to Sub-Saharan Africa to develop the infrastructure. And here at the ISS, we had a lot of debates about that, and a lot of African students said China is different. You see, here they're developing this infrastructure which the West never developed. And actually, now with hindsight, when we look at China, what they did was they developed an infrastructure that facilitated a greater extraction of the raw materials. So they were doing the same thing the West did, you know, that a lot of the infrastructure is fundamentally geared towards that raw material extraction. And it's not really designed to improve the competitiveness of that economy in a way that these countries are going to escape out of that raw material trap. Uh, and I think that's what's important with that infrastructure. So, of course, we will see a huge wave in the, in the coming... I, it would have been bigger if Hillary Clinton had uh, become president because they had already indicated that they were going to give huge amounts of money for infrastructure development. But there would have been two elements to that. The first is it would have been American companies that actually did the infrastructure work. And secondly, it would have been to serve the interests of the advanced countries. Thanks. So basically, uh, development aid that is aimed at developing infrastructure is no real development aid. That's what you would say. No, it's it's really it's really the the general principle that we don't give money 
to anything that's going to compete with us eventually, you know. And, and I, I accept that. I think it's fine. I mean, uh, it's, people moralize about it and say, oh, shame and terrible and so on. But actually, you know, let's say Sri Lanka becomes rich and powerful and I become advisor to the Sri Lankan government, I would tell them do the same thing. You know, we have to stay up there. We don't want, you know, these Indians coming and challenging us and doing other things, or all the Pakistanis or whoever. You know, I mean, we beat them at cricket and now we beat them at other things as well. Thank you. I think this concludes uh, our uh, the, 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 the content, basically, of, of our evening. Just before you leave, uh, one big thank you for Howard for his wonderful presentation. <laughs>